Hello, and thank you all for being here today. Over the course of this afternoon, you heard talks that inspired, that educated, that informed, and that motivated. And today, with my talk, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you to think about your place in society, and I'm going to challenge us all to make the world a better place. My inspiration for this talk came from the idea of what a spark represents. A spark represents a new beginning, a start, a level of excitement. But far too often, we focus on the beginning of something, and we fail to plan for what happens once it has sparked. I'll tell you a short story. When I was much younger, I enjoyed camping. Not so much anymore. And by the time I was 18, I was planning to go on survival camps, which essentially meant that uh, get rid of the tent, get rid of food, uh, go out with nothing but a pocket knife and a flint striker and have a fun time. Bit of a daunting thing now that I think about it. The very first day that I was out there, I was super excited. I explored everything. I was looking for food, I was looking for shelter, and I failed to plan for a campfire. The evening came, it became dusk, I collected wood, and I was preparing to make this fire, and it got real dark. It felt like the darkest night I've ever experienced. And while I sat there with that knife and that flint striker, and I saw spark after spark, I had hope. I had hope that I was going to be warm, that I was going to be safe that evening. And each spark fell into uh, nothingness. Now, the more often this was done, I got more fear and more fear and more fear welled up in me. Something that I have done a thousand times, something that I would have a great deal of security in doing, again, probably to this day, I was questioning myself at that very moment because it was very real. The fear was evident. Eventually it sparked and it caught fire and I had fire in my hand and I had a whole different problem on my, uh, my hands there. But I was warm that night and I was safe that night. See, the interesting thing about ideas is they're a lot like those sparks that caught fire in my story. Ideas, in fact, can spark and catch fire and become out of control. Bad ideas are the worst, which, which takes it to the thesis of my talk that nothing sparks faster than a bad idea. So bad ideas can range. Bad ideas can be benign, like a middle-aged man in a public setting with a man bun, or they can be malignant and reshape society and cause negative effects to the global community. I'm going to tell you another story about one of these malignant bad ideas. In 1998, a manuscript was published in a very prominent medical journal. This, in and of itself, is a pretty average thing. The difference here is that this particular paper was a spark that started a firestorm. Over the course of 13 years, the primary author on this paper quit his job and was discredited. The secondary authors on this paper removed their support from it and voluntarily pulled their names off of this paper. The hospital in which the research was conducted was sued multiple times. And it wasn't until about 12 years after this paper was published that a detailed analysis found out that the lead author lied, falsified data, changed records, and committed misconduct, often for financial gain. In scientific circles, I don't have to tell you that this is about as bad as it gets. Well, right after that investigation, that prominent journal redacted the paper, apologized, and everyone in the scientific community around that event patted themselves on the back, applauded the fact that the peer review process works, and that we have self-policed another bad scientist out of 
a journal. Great, wonderful. The problem is, is that the scientific community did not know that at that particular event was a bad idea. And it sparked, and it left the scientific community, and it went into circles all around the world and turned into a movement. At this point in time, you've probably put together that I am referencing the very first instance and wrong instance of vaccinations leading to autism. Now, I said that as a story. If you've stuck with me this far, please don't think this is another pompous scientist telling you about information. It's not the case. I'm a father as well, father of two. And I sat while my kids were getting vaccinated, and I questioned. And I was nervous, because what if, right? You have that fear. Now, the thing that's strange is, my PhD is in microbiology. I should know better. And I did. And that information pushed away that fear, and I've protected my kids. So I go back to the anatomy of a bad idea. A bad idea is equal parts fear and a lack of understanding. If we can change one element of this equation, that goes away. A bad idea stops. Now, I don't know about you, but fear, that's a really hard thing to change. It's ingrained in us. Fear, it was selected for. Fear of the unknown has kept us alive way back when. But now, fear is doing harm. We don't have that protective relationship with fear any longer. There's a scientist at Syracuse, and she studies disinformation. Who would have thought that that was now a discipline? Disinformation science. In an interview, she predicted, approximated, that our current way of consuming information will not change for about 50 years. That's two generations of people that have to be taught that the loudest screaming voice may not be the right answer. The individual with the most followers may, in fact, not be the one with the correct resolution. It's a scary place to be. So why is this not a talk you've heard before? Well, I believe, I feel, that the fault lies with the scientist, not the one that committed this uh, particular act, but the rest of us, right? We're communicating wrong. We're not doing this correctly. We strive to put our research in the most prominent research journals possible. And these are often behind paywalls or behind publishing contracts. Things we can't affect, but that's the game, so that's how we, we do this, right? Something's got to change. Our meetings, we go to far-off locations, often have to pay to be there, which by it very self restricts access. You have to be part of the system to be informed by the system. Seems a little strange. How do new people get involved? How do the masses get involved? Something's got to change. The most cited research paper of last year was referenced 49,000 times. I had to search that a few times over because that's a lot, 49,000 times, right? If you're thinking to yourself right now, wow, that must have been a really good paper. I'll restructure this question for you. Wow, why didn't you read it? Why didn't I read it? What is even the subject topic? As soon as I tell you what it is, you're going to be like, oh, that makes sense, right? It's on artificial intelligence and image, in, image recognition using artificial intelligence. It was published in 2016. It took four years to reach maturation. There's something wrong with the way we communicate. There is. We need to change the way we present information. Now, I'm standing up here and you're probably thinking, oh, this is amazing, I'm going to get told the answer. I don't have an answer. 
I'm not up here as a subject matter expert on how to resolve this. This is probably more of an elaborate cry for help and how do you fix this more than anything? I've identified the problem and I am in this new world with you and the system that I was told of how to participate in has changed around me and I don't know how to catch up. I don't. This hit real close to home with my oldest son. He's just gonna be ready to be 13 now. And years ago, he inspired my life's work. I was focused on one research topic, and he asked me one day what I did to save the animals, and I told him nothing, and he said I was a really bad biologist if I wasn't saving animals. And so I directed all of my work into the protection of wildlife through wildlife forensics. And I even named the project after him. And each time I publish a paper, I run to him with excitement. I'm like, look at your name. You did this? And I get, wow, cool dad. Which is preteen for, yeah, sure, whatever, in case you need that translation. <clears throat> he's more interested in video games than the science he's inspired. We are communicating wrong. Your science, your discipline, your life's passion should be exciting to other people. It just should. More so than what someone ate or whether or not they got a new dog. I don't care what movie they're in. It should be more entertaining. My favorite scientist is Marie Curie. Her work is incredibly inspirational. Two-time Nobel laureate, absolutely incredible human being. I think that that could not be any more relevant now as when the quote was first spoken. I would say it needs a little bit more of a modernization. That fear element still here. We're not getting rid of it. But this idea of removing uncertainty, she meant it in the form of research. We go out there and we research and we understand something more. And by understanding it, we remove that fear. This was definitely an idea before I had it. But what modern element, what twist needs to be made on this? To remove that uncertainty, we have to educate with humility. And we have to listen without judgment. And we have to meet people where they are because they want to know the information we have. They just don't understand all of the verbiage we put behind it. We're used to talking to others like us. And we wonder why it is that society doesn't hear scientific voices. We're not meeting people where they're at. So I challenge us all to have that humility to start up a conversation, to find a way to explain away uncertainty without resentment, without belittlement, and without mockery. The knowledge you have is because you invested time into it and you made a social contract that you would spread that information far and wide. So I challenge you to do it. Because one day, maybe soon, we'll be talking about how fast good ideas move. So thank you. <laughs>